Hi, this is Joe at the Pearl Stone, and I'm here today to talk about tending the wild or caretaking, which is my absolute favorite subject. I'm here on this 180 acre beautiful campus, the traditional lands of the Piscataway and the Susquehanna peoples, and I want to tell you a little bit about how indigenous people looked after the land um, and how um, we can help fix the land that we're currently now living on. I first became aware of caretaking um, at a class I took at the Tracker School and I heard a story by, from a man named Tom Brown Jr. about his mentor Stalking Wolf and in the story he talked about Stalking Wolf as a young child living in an area called the Hidden Valley and while living there he had a vivid dream or vision that these strange people were coming from a far off land and they were going to cut down this giant oak tree that their people had used for shade and for nuts and for other reasons for generations and how they were going to cut it down and make boards out of it. And this infuriated Stalking Wolf and he thought long and hard. But as he thought long and hard about this, he realized his own people kill the deer, his own people rip herbs from the ground, his own people gather plants for their food. And he started thinking, how are my people any different than these other people? It's just a matter of scale. And he started getting more and more depressed. Luckily for Stalking Wolf, his mentor, Coyote Thunder, had had that same vision when he was a child. And he said, grandson, come for a walk with me. And they walked along a riverbank for about three hours. And as they walked along the riverbank, Stalking Wolf noticed on the left side of the riverbank, there was lots and lots of animals, some of the most beautiful cathedrals of forests that he'd ever seen before. Tons of animal runs, tons of animal chews, animal rubs, birds, game, everywhere. But on the right side of this stream, there was hardly any animals. Maybe some insect damage, everything was really brushy, no wildlife. And this carried on for three hours. On the left, tons of animals, and on the right, no animals. And after three hours, he couldn't figure out why this was. And finally he said, he said, Coyote Thunder, I don't understand. Why are there so many animals on the left and so few on the right? And the answer Coyote Thunder gave him is he said, because grandson, this is the side we gather from and this is the side that we leave alone. And hearing this story started a lifelong journey for me to look and find out how indigenous peoples all over the planet looked after their ecosystem. And through my studies and my major of anthropology, I discovered time and time again that every time indigenous people were removed from their lands, the animal populations plummeted soon afterwards. And so this series of Tending the Wild Caretaking, I'm going to be showing small examples of how teachers can teach students how to help the landscape and be showing some large scale examples of how to manipulate the landscape. Okay, so how does this actually work in real life? And so traditionally, if I wanted to gather a stave or a sapling for a shelter pole or for a bow, I would need a straight tree. And some people might come to an area like this, to the edge of an ecosystem. And you can see on the edge right here, you can see the black cherry already producing berries. And you can see on this black haul, the flowers are forming. And this black haul will be producing a lot of fruit. And it's true, we could cut down these saplings and they would make a decent bow or a decent shelter pole. But because these trees have much more access, they get much more water and much more sun and much more nutrients than plants that are stuck in the middle of the forest, we don't want to cut this area down because if we do, it'll do a lot of harm to the ecosystem. So we're going to go out there and we're going to find a place where it would be beneficial for us to harvest a sapling. So come, follow me. So where would we find a sapling um, for our class? And at Pearlstone here, sometimes we'll have 20 or 30 kids in a class. And so we can make a big difference on helping the landscape by actually cutting out and removing certain plants um, from the landscape. So what we want to do is come into a place where a giant tree has maybe fallen down, a grandmother, grandfather oak, and we want to find a place where many saplings are growing up. And all these saplings are growing together and starting to kill each other off. It's kind of like Highlander. There can be only one. And eventually one sapling will get so tall that and so bashed and battered that it'll outlive all the other ones and it'll eventually start to produce a little fruit for the wildlife. But what we want to do is speed up that process. And so with a group of children, we'll give them a bandana and they'll search around here and say, which tree do we want to survive? Which one is going to produce the most food? 
and maybe they might come over here and they might say, hey, this black cherry looks a little better than the other ones and we want to help this black cherry. So they might wrap this bandana and they're going to try to keep this tree alive. And then they're going to come around and they're going to gather the saplings that they want for their project. So in this case, there is a maple that I want um, that I need for a certain project. And so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to uh, look at this maple. And this maple is also a good choice because it's got some dead stuff on it. It's kind of interfering with some of these other trees here. And I need this lower section um, for the project. And, um, and so this is a good one for me to cut out. And you also want to see how it feels because sometimes your gut will tell you a lot. Sometimes it's like, no, this is the wrong tree to cut out. And so what I'm going to do is come down as close to the ground as I can. And I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to We're going to cut this sapling down and then I don't want to leave a sign of my work and I want to cut it as level to the ground or as close as I can and then I want to rub in dirt to the cut so the cut already disappears and you can see there already was another cut here another sapling that had been cut off this stump before um, in this area but much of this area has been improved by lots of cutting from the kids. And so, now I'm going to take off this part. I'm going to use two pieces of this for a later project. Um, and I'm going to take this sapling back and use it later. Last note, trees harvested in this way, since they're growing up tight with other trees, their growth rings are a lot tighter. So they make a better product, whether it be a bow or a shelter pole. The other thing is, if we cut out enough of these saplings here, this tree will start producing food at a much earlier age. And looking at some forestry studies, it's really important to clear trees around the younger saplings at an earlier age if you want to see a larger output of food by the tree. If you let the trees grow too old and eventually clear out from it, it'll help some, but you won't get the same, you won't get as big a difference in food production. So in certain sites around Pearlstone where we've had a sapling like this and we've cut 20 ones around it, within a year or two, those saplings started producing large amounts of food where otherwise they might never produce food. So now that we learned how to ha harvest a sapling and help the ecology of the landscape of Pearlstone, we're gonna see how this works in a smaller scale and in a larger scale. So take um, your garden, for instance. When you're planting tomatoes, you might plant three little tomatoes in each um, starter that you're starting. And as the three tomatoes grow up, you're going to pull out your weakest two and leave your strongest one. And that way you get your strongest tomato. The other thing you're going to do is when you plant your tomatoes, you're going to plant them in a group. But in that group, you're going to break them up with flowering plants that can attract parasitizing wasps. And the problem is if you planted all the tomatoes together and you got the horn uh, worm on your tomato, then it could jump from one tomato to another to another and you would lose all your tomatoes. That's one of the big advantages of cutting out many of the saplings in your area so disease won't spread. And in fact, in the area we were just at, disease was already spreading amongst those saplings. And so um, cutting more saplings out in the area would be highly recommended. Now we come into this great oak hickory forest that's absolutely beautiful and we want to see how this worked on a large scale. So traditionally what Native Americans would do is they would thin out certain trees, maples being one of them and sweet gums being another, and they would light low level fires through these forests. And if you come over and look right here, you can see this, um, it's called, um, it's called low bush blueberry. And you can little patches of it here and if we set this forest on fire the flames might only burn about this high what we would see in the following year is this whole forest floor covered with low bush blueberry and in fact you would probably see an 800% increase in food 
And for the next five years, these blueberries would be having blueberries on them, where currently there are no blueberries. The other things that would happen is we might go from five understory species to possibly 30 understory species, because an oak hickory forest is a fire ecosystem. So this plant we talked about before in one of the wild edible videos is called barberry. And among barberry, there's been studies where there's been 10% higher amount of deer ticks around it and a 10% increase in Lyme disease. But here, um, and that is because of the white-footed mouse liking to hang out underneath of it. But here we have so many squirrels that we have huge patches of barberry and we have lots of white-footed mice, but we still have no ticks. And that's simply because of the high population of gray squirrels and flying squirrels. And your trees are not going to produce that many nuts if they're jammed in really tight. So it's really important to have your oak trees spaced out. Ideally, if they're spaced out so there's a 30% canopy gap, that is what your ecosystem needs. And there are studies now using cattle in the forest to really help the ecosystem um, repair itself. And those have been really successful as well. Now, if we go to the example of in South America in the Brazilian rainforest, um, they recently discovered that more than 50% of the Brazilian rainforest was actually man-made. And what they discovered was, and you might have learned part of this in school, is that they might take an area of three acres, maybe nine acres, and they would clear the small, they would girdle the smaller trees, they would girdle all the trees, and then once everything dried out, they would light the whole area on fire, and then they would clear the smaller trees, and then they would leave the bigger trees, and they would garden around them. And they might garden up those plots anywhere from like two to three years um, usually and then they would go away and it's called slash burn agriculture but that isn't exactly what they did they didn't just go away when they came back they thought oh here's the ice cream bean tree here's the brazil nut tree oh wait there's five brazil nut trees growing right next to each other and so they would cut out four of the brazil nut trees and leave the strongest one growing up they might say here's a maple tree here's a sweet gum tree We're like we don't want those trees here because those trees do not provide a lot of food for the wildlife and so when you look at the study in the um, Amazon rainforest, over 50% of the forest has a very small percentage of the trees. And you can tell where man-made habitats were by looking at what the tree canopy is in that forest. And you can find that story in Smithsonian Magazine. So if you want an ecosystem without ticks and you're in an oak hickory forest, what you need to do is you need to thin out your maples and you need an abundance of oak and hickory trees. And you want trees that are going to mast on a regular basis. And if you're in a lower land area, you can have other types of food producing trees like black walnut or shell bark hickory. And shell bark hickory is great because it mast or produce nuts every year. So that's a highly recommended one in the ecosystem. So to recap, you want fewer maples, fewer sweet gums, and you want more nut producing and um, fruit producing trees. Mm -hmm.